Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here this morning. We're gonna get started in just a couple minutes, but while we're waiting, go ahead and click that share button. Let all your friends and family know what you're watching this morning. Uh, for those of you gonna watch live with us here today, take advantage of that chat function. Say hi to everybody that's here. We're gonna get, on, get going in just a minute. We are so glad to be here and are looking forward to worshiping with you today. Uh, we are, and we're, we're going to have a great time just worshiping together and being in the Word. word. But first, I want, we want to take just a few minute, moments to recognize some of the things that are going on in our world right now. Uh, you can't turn the TV on or, or your computer on without uh, hearing of just crisis. And uh, whether it's from the COVID-19 issues and, and the responses to that, or more recently in the past uh, couple weeks, uh, the killing of George Floyd and, and the varied responses to all that. <clears throat> this week, we have been uh, talking to community leaders and, and just people really around the country going like, what is the best path forward and how can we move forward in, in healing? Um, some of these deep wounds in our society and and we're going to continue to do so i've got a prayer meeting with community leaders right here in lincoln uh, tonight and and throughout the week and so we're gonna we're striving to honor god in the way that we respond to this issue of racism but really what it comes down to it starts in the church and it starts even with the individuals uh within the church church it starts with you and I. This is not a political issue as much as it is a heart issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a police issue as much as it is a heart issue. And so this morning we want to take a few moments as we, as we pray to get into our service. We're going to take a few moments just to pray over our, our nation and the brokenness that we see um, all around us right now. And it really starts with us, right? Mm -hmm. It really starts, um, I, I believe the correct response is to always look inward. And I think of King David in Psalm 139 when he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. And I believe that's where we as Christians, we as the body of Christ, we need to look at every situation we find ourselves in. And before we respond, ask the Lord to look inside, show us if we're having anxious thoughts or wicked thoughts. And, and before we can truly respond in Christ's love, I think we have some of that that we need to deal with with the Lord first. Mm -hmm. Because God celebrates the diversity that we have among Absolutely. ourselves. I mean, what we see in the scripture that one day we'll, we'll stand before God and there will be every tribe, tongue, color, background, ethnicity represented. And, uh, and that's a beautiful thing to celebrate. And we're gonna continue to celebrate that. Um, but like you said in the scripture, we gotta, we gotta start at home and we gotta start with us. So, so we're gonna just go ahead and take a moment. We're gonna pray uh, that God would just meet with us during our worship, during the word, that we'd be challenged, encouraged. But we're gonna take a moment as well to pray for our city, for our state, for our nation right now, um, as we move forward with God's help to see true reconciliation, to see true healing of the brokenness in so many different ways. Let's pray together, would you? Uh, Father, we thank you so much for uh, the fact that you are a God who brings reconciliation. You are a God who brings healing. You are a God that unites and not divides. And so Lord, we just ask that right now as our, <clears throat> as our city and as our country are navigating uh, so much of the, this pain and this hurt and this aggression, uh, Father, may we uh, follow you boldly, courageously, wisely, and graciously into wherever you're leading us. And, and God, I, I also ask that you would um, 
Like David, we pray, would you see if there's any wicked way in me? God, we want to represent you well as your church, as your extension to the world uh, that we live in today. So God, do a work in us. And Lord, as we as we turn to a time of worship, Lord, we glorify you. We lift you up. May you be pleased with our worship. God, speak to our hearts. Our eyes, our ears are open and attentive to what you want to do in me, in us, through this time together. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, if you're there watching this with... Um, with a watch party, you're in your home, you had some friends over, uh, be sure that before you're done to take some time just to pray for one another, to lift each other's needs up. And let's celebrate the opportunity that we have for some of us to gather together in, in homes. And I hope you have an incredible time worshiping the Lord together and being the church together right there in your homes across the city uh, here in Lincoln. So thank you for doing that. If you're watching by yourself, we're glad you're tuning in and being a part of our Crossroads Church online service this morning.
been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will see of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will see of the goodness of god i love your voice oh you have led me through the fire darkest night oh, you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God oh, all my life you have been faithful Of the goodness of God. Yeah, yeah. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. the goodness of God. Yeah, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing
Hey, Crossroads family, welcome, we miss you, but are so glad that you're joining us for Church Online. Remember to check in, we wanna know that you're here. You can use that QR code or go to linkingcrossroads.com. Everything you need is there on our website, easy to find, easy to click, prayer requests, check in, everything you need, one-stop shop, so make sure to jump on there. Also, follow us on Facebook. I know most of you are already, but lots of cool things going on on there. So continue to follow us, and we will continue to put fun updates to look for those. Speaking of fun updates, watch parties. I don't know if you've been a part of this or heard about this yet, but we are doing and wanting to promote watch parties among church members. So if you're comfortable with it, invite a friend over, invite a couple over, maybe a family to your house, and watch together on Sunday mornings. We want to create some community with this online church. But remember, we want to respect whatever you are comfortable with, so don't feel obligated, just a fun idea. Also, during this time, continue giving. We have been so blessed here at Crossroads um, just to have tithes continue to come in. Our Build is Church uh, campaign is continuing to just be amazing, so thank you for that. Continue with your online giving. We really appreciate all the things that are happening and all the things Crossroads is able to do with that money. Lastly, if you have any questions, you can always uh, email us at lnkcrossroads at gmail.com. We can answer any questions, prayer requests, things you need there as well. Thanks so much. Good to see you guys. Hey, what's up, everybody? So glad that you're here with us this morning and, and here studying God's Word together and worship together with our Crossroads Church online service. I look forward to the time, hopefully soon, when we can see each other face to face. You know, in, in the middle of, of all the things that are happening in, in our world today and all the conversation, all the talk that's happening, one of the phrases that, that we hear from time to time right now is this phrase, the new normal. Now, I don't know what your initial reaction is to that phrase, but, but hearing that so much, it got me thinking, like, what is normal really? Like, isn't normal for one person different from what normal is from another and, and, and that word normal is just a hard one to process. So, so as I was looking at my life, like what dictates normal? What, what, how do I find normal in the way that I do things, in the, the way that I relate to people? What is normal for me? And as I look at others, what is normal? I, I come to realize there, there's a couple contributing factors that really define where normal settles uh, for me in a lot of different things. And, and that is, it's, it's the spot where convenience meets what is acceptable, right? Where what is convenient meets where what is acceptable, somewhere in that ballpark is where we tend to find, or at least I often tend to find, normal. Uh, for instance, what is a normal dinner at the Swihearts? So let me tell you what a normal dinner at Swihearts house is. Oftentimes, we will have a rotisserie chicken from Sam's. They're really good. They're inexpensive. And also a, a one of those packaged salads, right? They just, all the ingredients there, you stir it up and you're good to go. That's a normal meal at the Swihart house. Why? Because it's super convenient and pretty inexpensive and acceptable, right? Like I'm not just feeding my kids like ice cream and ho-hos, right? So like it's an acceptable meal and, and it's convenient. And so it has become a staple. It has become normal at our house. Now that we're moving into the, the summer months, uh, what also becomes very normal is grilling some chicken, some burgers, some brats, that kind of stuff. We're outside already. It's very convenient. Crack open the grill, throw the meat on there, that same packaged salad, all right? That is convenient, and it's a decent meal. It's acceptable, right? Why don't we have these elaborate five-course, seven-course meals every night of the family? Well, because it's not convenient at all. Why don't we let our kid just go to the pantry and pick out whatever prepackaged item they can find out of there and call it dinner? Because, well, that's just not acceptable. So what we do is we find that place where acceptable meets, or acceptable meets convenient, and, and that oftentimes becomes normal. How much TV do you watch? It's where convenience meets acceptable. What time do you go to bed at night? There's some of you, you would love to go to bed at 6 p.m. every single night. That'd be amazing. Uh, but it's kind of when people do stuff, so it's not very convenient. Others of you would love to go to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. Why don't you? Because you got a job that starts. you got to be there at 7 in the morning, and that becomes not quite acceptable on the long term, right? So, so what, I've, uh, what I've identified is if you just look around at the world around us, so much of what we call normal is, is that moment, it's that point, where we say, 
this is convenient and this is acceptable. One person keeps their house immaculate. It's never dirty ever. The other person, uh, this person would call this person a slob. This person would call this person a neat freak, right? Why do they do what they do? Why are they different? Is one better than the other? Well, this person uh, says, I don't mind cleaning. I actually kind of enjoy it. It's therapeutic for me. And I really can't stand a messy house. This person says, so my house has signs that people live in it. Big deal. Like a mess doesn't really bother me and I hate cleaning. It's inconvenient, right? They're going to each find their own normal in their own home. It's going to be different, but it's going to be normal to them because it's where convenience meets acceptability. That's all good and fine. There's nothing right or wrong necessarily about all of that. The problem is, though, that we've oftentimes allowed our own spiritual lives to settle in in that bowl of convenience and acceptability, right? Like how much sin is too much sin? (laughs) How much serving is enough serving? Right. How much? How if 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 I serve a little bit? Like I, I don't really like um, thinking of other people, <laughs> right? Uh, but to like be totally selfish, kind of unacceptable. So I gotta I gotta serve people a little bit. I know the tithing thing. Like I know a lot of people don't do it, so I don't feel super pressure to that. But I know I'm I'm at least generous a little bit. So there's a little bit of convenience in kind of doing it my way. But I'm gonna. Uh, it's socially acceptable to you know I can be generous as much as I want here, All right? Okay, so I've got a little bit of an anger problem. Like I've never, I'm not going to hit anybody, but sometimes I explode a little bit. But you know what? That's just kind of how I am. It's not a huge, I, I usually, most times at least I go and I apologize to whoever, but like uh, to, I don't want to bottle it up, right? That would be inconvenient and oh, and I justify it anyway. And, and, and people seem to be fine with the way that I live as long as I, as long as I apologize, right? We, the norms and even the way that we live our lives, the way that we go about our lives, so often the, 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 what is normal in the Christian life for me and you is what is convenient and what is acceptable. Friends, God has called us to more than that. You know, there's, there's another group of people who, who, who a group of people who, who resist who resist the passivity of that normal. They resist the status quo. And in every aspect of their life, they strive for excellence. They're just wired different, right? They're not going to allow convenience and ex- what is acceptable to, to, to navigate them. So they're going to they're gonna excel. They're going to they're gonna go for it. They're going to go above and beyond. They're, they're going to achieve. In everything they do, in everything, that they're going to uh, go after it. And, and then what? And then what? To what end? The problem, I think, is not necessarily that we've, we've, we've settled too much, but we're looking at life completely from the wrong perspective. In fact, I would even argue, even those who say, I'm not going to just settle, even those who say, I'm not going to allow normal to be what is convenient, what is acceptable, the truth of the matter is they just have their own dif- definition of what is acceptable. So maybe what they're doing, they're striving, isn't as convenient as what the next person is doing, but they have such high expectations of themselves for what is acceptable, it's still where they've found their norm. It's that balance between what is convenient and what is acceptable. And so when it comes to our Christian life, I think sometimes we, 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 when, when we look into what the Scripture says, what James says is the mirror of God's Word, we look at this and go, oh, Right? We look at the world around us and go like, hey, hey, this, this Christian thing, um, it's fine. I, I, I do some of this stuff that's, uh, to the point where it's not too inconvenient, but what's also socially acceptable. Uh, and not just like socially acceptable in culture, but in our, even our little like church subculture. What is, what is convenient? What is acceptable? And there's some that you look at, like I'm going through life and I'm just fine. And then you open up the word and you're like, ah, that doesn't look like me. And you begin to recognize that I, I've settled in the, this place of 
normalcy that is not healthy and it's not biblical. It's not what God has called us to. And, and so what do you do? You try to take the approach of the, the, the excellent seeker. I'm not going to settle. I'm going to strive for excellence in my, in my relationship with God. I'm going to strive for excellence. And the problem is, and then that sounds really good, right? That sounds like a great strategy. But, but the problem is you didn't need to work harder. You just needed to look at it from a completely different perspective. So I love our text today. As we get into it, Paul is, is, is writing to his, his group of friends here. And, and he's speaking of his own mortality. He's sincerely looking death in the face right now. And he writes this line. I'm sure you're familiar with it. He says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, that is so tough, isn't it? Right, you've probably seen that on po Christian posters or T-shirts or bumper stickers. To live is Christ and to die is gain. It's got that, that, that epic, uh, resounding yeah to it, doesn't it? But, but I want to look a little deeper. Because what this exposes is, is, is Paul's perspective. We're going to look at the words that he says and what he has to say, but I want, to, I want you to focus today, this morning here, on what does this say about Paul's perspective? How Paul processes what's happening to him. How Paul processes what's going on around him. How Paul lays out his, his spiritual life and, and, and the very life that he's living to live as Christ and to die as gain. First, first, I want us to, to slow down just a moment and, and think about this, not on, from a perspective of a Christian poster, but from the actual context that it was written in. Uh, let's go on and see what else he has to say about this. He says, if I am to go on living in the body, so if I don't die, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know, yet I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So we hear this Paul Declare that, that epic statement, to live is Christ and to die is gain, and it sounds great. But I want you to, to picture these same words, like the follow-up where he explains what, that, what he's talking about when he says that. I want you to picture, not just from one pers that perspective, but from like the actual context that it was written in, a letter written from one group of friends to another. In fact, again, we know that, that the Philippian church had just reached out to Paul and uh, was reaching out because they're concerned about him. He's in prison in Rome. He just appealed to, to, uh, to Nero, which we all know Nero isn't real favorable to Christians. It's not looking very good for him. And the Philippian believers are going, hey, Paul, are you okay? Are you doing okay? And this is what Paul says back. He says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I were to go on living, there'd be more work for me to do. But what do I choose? Like, if it was up to me, though, um, if I want to be honest with you, best case scenario, if I'm just selfishly, best case scenario right now would be if that jailer hands me over to the executioner, he takes off my head, and I go be with Jesus today. I mean, think about it. that. If you're reading this letter from the first time, you're going, whoa, Paul, are you okay? And to, to read this just now, you go, wow, that, that, that seems bleak. I mean, he said, you, you choose to die. Like, that's what you want right now? He says, it would be better by far. Like, what brings 
What brings Paul to this position? A life that was completely and absolutely poured out for Christ. This is, this is where Paul has been. He tells us a little bit about it in, in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. He says, five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times. I want you to picture the flogging of Christ. Five times Paul endured something very similar to that. Five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones, or, or stoned, your translation might read. Um, basically, this was a death sentence. They drag you outside of town, and, and they just and pelt you. Now, we're not talking about little rocks with big old stones for the purpose to kill you. For somebody to hit a, a head blow that would take you out, he was left for dead. And yet God did not allow him to die that day. So five times he'd been flogged, been beaten with rods, pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. Paul's being real with his friends here in Philippi. He says, guys, I'm done. I fought the good fight. I finished the race, and I'm ready to see Jesus now. Now, I want you to get something, though, that he wasn't writing from a depressed perspective. He wasn't writing from a, from a uh, suicidal perspective. Rather, in fact, the, the, the heart behind what I'm saying, the, the, the gravity behind this has to be read into it. I mean, obviously you get there if, if a man is saying, like, I'm ready to die today. I'm ready to go home. But he's not saying it in this, this, this overwhelmed, depressed status. In fact, you remember just a couple of verses earlier, he, he's talking about this opposition. These people who are coming at me, these people that are trying to, to make life harder for me, trying to make me jealous and trying to, to steal and come in on my influence. Like, like all these people who are coming at me, he's like, it doesn't even matter. So the same Paul, he's overwhelmed. Life has been difficult for him. Life, the journey has been hard. And now, even still, at this point in life, it's still getting harder. He says, but what does it matter? And this is, this is critical. He says, and because of this, I rejoice. Because of what? Because I can see what God is doing even in the midst of my pain. I can see where God is at, even in the midst of my conflict. I can see that God is moving. He had a perspective that was not a temporal perspective, a, a, a perspective that was based on the circumstances that are happening to him and around him. But rather, he had a perspective that was an eternal perspective. And from that place, he goes, I'm overwhelmed, I'm tired. I'm ready to go meet Jesus. But you know what? I continue to rejoice today. People are coming at me. They're making life hard for me, but I'm going to continue to rejoice. And he says again, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So Paul says this in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He meant it. You see, so many of us, we, we, we are confronted with, with, with fears. Fear upon fear after fear. Anxiety upon anxiety upon anxiety. Uncertainty brings that anxiety. See, but Paul, this, this is so amazing. Paul, when he takes a perspective that is not a temporal perspective, but rather an eternal perspective, it turns his anxiety into anticipation. Friend, God wants to do the same for you. 
What is that thing that is anxious about? Here, here's the thing that, that Paul constantly had, this, this eternal perspective where he goes, man, I know this, that God doesn't waste pain. God doesn't waste heartache. God doesn't waste hurt. God doesn't waste a conflict. And so I know if I'm going through something right now, and if there's opposition in my life right now, I'm not going to be filled with anxiety, but rather I'm going to be filled with anticipation because I know God is up to something. He had this ability to always see what God was doing. And when he couldn't see what God was doing, he was always looking for it. So friend, what are those anxieties that you're allowing to grip you, that that fear that you're allowing to overwhelm you? Let me tell you one of the key differences between our fear and Paul's joy, between our anxiety and his anticipation is this that when we view the things that are happening to us and around us from a temporal perspective, meaning, meaning from this earth, a material perspective, this, this, this flesh and blood earth, it's going to lead to fear and anxiety. But friends, when we walk up to the scripture, we open the words of scripture, this word of life, and we begin to view the circumstances of our lives and begin to view the things that are happening around us from an eternal perspective. I mean, Paul writes about this when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says to set your mind on, 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 uh, on what is unseen because what is unseen is uh, because what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. In and, and Colossians, he, he says, uh, set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. See, Paul had this ability to be able to look beyond the temporal world that he lived in and, and see everything that was happening to him from, a temporal, or from an eternal perspective. And friends, when we are able to carry that eternal perspective, our fear turns to joy, our anxiety turns to anticipation. If you're walking through a hard time right now, just be reminded God is at work somewhere doing something for his glory and your good. May that anxiety turn into anticipation. So here's Paul, right? Like overwhelmed with with the burdens of life and yet he doesn't allow the the things that are happening to him and the things that are happening around him uh, dictate his attitude, dictate his mindset, dictate his perspective but instead he says this and so this is this is what i want to see paul's perspective i I, I, we talked about this before right we're going to get back to this idea of normal you see paul had a different normal and and it wasn't because his his spiritual life was was on the path to excellence but rather he was able to view the things that are happening to him and the things that were happening around him not from a temporal perspective where, where normal is measured by convenient, where convenient meets acceptable. Hey, this is a convenient, this is acceptable, this is what my life is going to be. Paul didn't do that, and he didn't say, I'm going to up it to the next level and, and pursue excellence. Rather, he said, I'm not even going to view what is happening to me right now. I'm not even going to view my life from a temporal perspective. I'm going to view it from an eternal perspective. And so everything that happened to him, every decision that he made, every ministry that he did, everything, that, every relationship that he had, every conversation that he had, it wasn't based on what is happening here in this world, but what is happening in the next. The ability to see what God is doing, even in the midst of challenge. It brings joy, it brings anticipation, but it also provides a new baseline for establishing a new normal. Friends, some of us in our spiritual lives, it is time for a new normal. You have been coasting for so long in that that comfortable balance between comfort and what is acceptable. And you've just been riding this out. Friends, with everything that's going on around us today, with all of the changes, this would be a really good time for some 
evaluating of your own soul, evaluating of your own, not just, not just the spiritual side of things, but your own life, the way that you live your life. Is my life being lived for Christ? I mean, Paul describes what the Christian life ought to look like, what the normal Christian life ought to look like. And he says, I urge you in Romans 12, 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. This is the new normal. Living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your, this is your act of worship. He says, Do, don't, be tr- don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, this, this comfort and acceptable. Don't be, don't be conformed to that pattern anymore, but be transformed and see God's will enacted in your life. Some of us today need a new, to find a new normal. Our normal has been dictated by what is comfortable and what is acceptable, and a relationship with God is struggling because we're just getting by. Still, others, you need to find a new normal, and you've not been, you've not been uh, content with status quo. You've been pursuing excellence, but you're pursuing excellence in your own strength. You're p- pursuing, like, uh, like, if I just read my Bible more, if I just tell more people about Jesus, if I just give a little bit more, if I just serve a little bit more, you're, you're going to fall into that trap of a little bit more. But how much is enough? See, the new normal is set. Paul sets his normal a different way. You see, all of this thinking is, is thinking from a temporal perspective, a this world perspective. But Paul sees things from an eternal perspective. And in that perspective, this is how he sets his norm. What exalts Christ and lifts up others. Like there's, there's his middle ground. That, that's what I'm going to do. Whatever exalts Christ and lifts up others. What is so amazing about this to me is verse 22. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Like that is super matter of fact. If I'm not going to die, this is what that means. If I'm not going to die, I'm going to keep working for the Lord and it's going to be fruitful. How can, first of all, one, like there's no other options, right? Like retirement. Like if I were to go on living, I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. I'm going to go retire. I'm going to move somewhere warm and spend my retirement enjoying life. No, that wasn't his option. He says, if, if I survive this, if I don't die here in this, in this, in lockup, I'm going to, what that means then is that I'll be doing more fruitful labor for the kingdom of God. Friends, I, I just want to challenge you, those who are retired or those who are looking forward to that, regardless of your age. The American view of retirement or concept of retirement that I'm going to put in my work and then I'm going to selfishly indulge for the rest of my life is not a biblical concept. That's a temporal perspective. Now, I get there's phases of life, and, and, and by all means, enjoy the life that God has given you. But to think that you can wash your hands of the work that God has called us to, friends, is a shallow, temporal perspective view. I don't care how old you are, friends. God has fruitful labor for you today. Fruitful labor for you today. So those of you who are, you want to, you're working towards retirement, and once I hit retirement, then I'm just going to golf every single day, and I'm going to move somewhere where it's beautiful, and I'm going to enjoy every, that's great, do that, but, but do we not also have the capacity to find ways that exalts Christ and lifts up others? Friends, this is the norm that God is calling us to. So how are you doing that today? Friends, it's time to begin to put some building blocks back into play to find a new normal. I believe God is calling all who are dissatisfied with their current uh, Christian life who say, man, I want more. I want all of what Christ has to give me. And it's not found in striving harder. It's not found in working harder. It's not found in pursuing excellence. It's found by simply uh, asking that question, what glorifies Christ or what lifts up Christ and what lifts up others. Friends, that's the trajectory to begin to point your life. Here Paul says, Man, if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what do I choose? Not that he actually had a choice, but what did he want? What he really wanted was to go be with the Lord. 
He says, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And I'm convinced of this. I, I know that I will remain. Like he was convinced. I, I'm not, I'm not going to die here. And I will continue with all of you in for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. He is in prison facing his own death. And he's going, I would love to die, but I really think that God is going to keep me here a little bit longer because I can clearly see how my still being here is going to exalt Christ in you and lift you up. This was his norm. This was how he thought. He didn't have to, to, this wasn't somebody told him he needs to think like this. Like life revolved around exalting Christ and lifting others up. So how are you following in that example? Friend, what's, what's your normal Christian life look like? Have you settled to a place of, uh, of finding what's convenient and what's acceptable and just coasting? Or maybe you've, you've taken the efforts in your own hands. Like that's the temporal perspective. That's the way that we think as, as human beings. That's for many of us our default that I'm going to, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to settle. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to strive harder. Friends, that's not the answer either. Friends, it's time to find a new normal. As we're in this, this season of kind of putting some of the building blocks of life back together, would we also consider how we might put the building blocks of our spiritual life back together as well? That we might come to God with openness and vulnerability and say, God, I, I've, where I've been is not where you're calling me. I'm ready for a new normal. God, where in my life, what are the areas in my life where, where you're leading me to exalt Christ and, and lift others up? Where, where are those places? Because, friends, as we begin to view life from an eternal perspective, from God's perspective, what's going to happen is those fears that you're holding on to, that anxiety that you're holding on to, just like we talked about, the fear will turn to joy, the anxiety to anticipation. Paul was in prison, but he wasn't depressed. He was ready to be done, but he wasn't suicidal. There was joy that filled his heart in the midst of his trial. How can he do that? Because he wasn't looking from a temporal perspective. He was looking from an eternal perspective. So friends, what scenario of your life do you need to just look at from a whole new angle? What spiritual activity are you doing that has grown tired and weary and you need to just allow the Holy Spirit to breathe some fresh life into you and give you his perspective? Friends, because as we begin to exalt Christ, as we begin to lift others up, and we choose, God, I want to I see. I want to see things like you see. I want to see people like you see them. I want to see setbacks like you see them. I want to see like you see so I can live like you've called me to live. Friends, that is what Paul was describing in Romans 1 or Romans 12. That is what it means to, to, live, to, to give your life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Friends, will we find a new norm today? Will we choose to see life, see events, from his perspective, not mine. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and praise you for your amazing will and plan for our lives. God, I thank you once again that, that, that for that promise that you said that you've come, that you would give us life and life to the fullest. And yet, God, so many of us, Lord, forgive us, so many of us have settled for this status quo Christianity. So, Father, I pray in this midst of finding new norms that you would find a new, that we would find a new normal in you. God, that we would, that we would reject that, that old way of thinking not just in settling, but even viewing life from that temporal perspective that we might see you for who you are. God, you are so good. And in you, there's hope. In you, there's joy. So Lord, teach us to see like you see, 
to live from eternal perspective. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And lastly today, if you are watching with us, but you've never put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you on your own right there, wherever you're at, would you stop in a minute? Don't just, just hit pause on the screen. Would you, would you take a moment to just surrender your life to God? Say a prayer. Maybe you don't know how, know how to pray. It's simple. Just talk to him like you would to anybody who walked in the room and tell him, God, I'm choosing to live for you. I receive the grace and the forgiveness that you offer through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And today, I'm choosing to live for you. And the Bible says that God will come in and make you brand new. Friends, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited, anticipating what God is going to do in our lives as we step from a temporal perspective to one, uh, to an eternal perspective. Thanks so much for joining us and worshiping with us here at Crossroads this morning. I know we have a lot of watch parties going on around the city of Lincoln. I don't know about you, but for me, it has just been so special these last couple of weeks of just being able to get together, even with a small group and worship together. It's been really sweet. So I hope you're able to enjoy that this morning. And for those of you who are not quite ready to do that, whether you're in the at-risk category or just not feeling comfortable yet to worshiping with others, we totally understand and respect that and honestly believe that's the best choice uh, for many right now. Uh, but if you're watching alone and you do feel comfortable being around people and you feel safe being around others, uh, but you just uh, didn't join one of these parties, let me, let me encourage you to be the one to, to take initiative. So right now, like even right now as we're talking, pull out your phone, text a friend, uh, give somebody a call, and invite somebody to your place to watch next week. Uh, now that our, our DHMs have relaxed a little bit in Nebraska, uh, we've got the ability to be able to invite up to 25 people. Or if you feel more comfortable, just invite a friend or a couple friends. Uh, keep it simple if you want. But uh, it is an exciting time where we get to now have the opportunity to be able to gather together, not at church quite yet, but gather together in homes to be able to worship together. There's something about that, that worship time when you're with the uh, others who are worshiping with you that just is so special. So we want to encourage you, take some initiative next week and create one of those walk parties for yourself. But for now, we have a prize to give away. We sure do. Our Facebook challenge this week came from Axel and Randy Nelson. Thanks, guys. Thank they, you, guys. Um, they called it a pay it forward challenge. And, you know, we've all experienced different random acts of kindness this mm -hmm. last few months. And they just encouraged us to pay it forward. And we had some great responses. People planting trees for people in the community who couldn't physically do that. Mm -hmm. uh, people sharing their testimony and encouraging friends over Zoom. And uh, we love seeing that. So thanks for your responses. But we want to give the prize this week to our very own Tina Rothy. Congrats, Tina. Tina was out this week. She was doing some grocery shopping for some people in the community who are at a higher risk. And um, just it's safer for them to be at home right now. So good job, Tina, doing their grocery shopping for them. Thanks for being so thoughtful. And we'll get you your prize later this week. Good job, Tina. Uh, and then lastly, as always, we're having our Zoom time. So if you would like to connect with some people at church, not just by watching a video, but actually being able to uh, connect online, we'd love for you to join our, our Zoom group that's happening right now. Pastor Grady and Sandy are go going to be facilitating that right now. Uh, you can find our Zoom uh, password and ID in the chat function in the chat box. Uh, if you take a look at this moment and uh, you'll be ready for it. Otherwise, it's the normal Crossroads Zoom meeting ID. And we would love for you to be able to connect with others uh, from Crossroads right now. So hop on there and uh, you'll get ready to go.